Emmanuel Episcopal Church and our service celebrating the life of Vince, Vincent Freeman. We're so glad you're here with us. This is a full service bulletin, and so everything should be in here for you. We thank you for wearing your mask over your mouth and nose uh, to keep those among us safe who need that. We begin together on page four, saying the anthem that begins, I am resurrection. So together we say, I am resurrection, and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he dies. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold, him who is my friend, and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our beloved Vincent. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please be seated. Now let us say together Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please know that, that you are invited to sit the whole time if you're comfortable. If you want to stand when we sing, please do. It's not required any of it, just how you're comfortable is how we'd like you to do that.
a reading from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. The word of the Lord. I'm grateful to all of you for coming together so that we can prayerfully and intentionally complete this process, handing our beloved then into the hands of God, the eternal hand of God. In the back of the bulletin, there's a little description. I hope you've seen it about Ben's life. It's pretty remarkable. I wish I'd known him. But I know his family, some of them. And I can see the legacy he left. It's a good one. The reason that we do this is because love costs us. Love costs Jesus his life. Love costs us these moments where we mourn the loss of a love. Sometimes we cry. We gather to share joy, the joy of having known someone like Ben, having loved him, or having heard of him, in my case. We share joy as much as we share grief, because that's the Christian experience of fullness of life. It's all of it. But the one thing that holds us in hope is the promise Jesus gave us. And he said in our gospel today, do not let your hearts be troubled. Because you know, I prepared a place for Ben. I greeted him when he came. Can you picture it? Ben is leaving this earthly plane and heading into eternal life. And there, standing, waiting for him, is Jesus. And come on. Well done, faithful servant. Come and see the place I have prepared for you. Lay down your burden. We know Ben to be a man of fidelity and courage, a man who loved God, his country, his family, his church. And while we don't get to have relationship with him here, like this, the flesh, we never ever lose the love that bound us in the beginning, the love that comes to us through Jesus. I apologize, like I had anything to do with this, that the pandemic delayed us this long. It's hard to hold that alone, but I celebrate that we now can come together, share the memories, share the life Share the love, because it's in communion, it's in relationship, where we're healed and made whole. So let's celebrate that Jesus greeted Ben, said, come on, I've been preparing your place. Come see. Come live here in eternal peace and joy with me. And while we don't have him here in the flesh, we have him among the communion of saints. And there, with the whole company of heaven, who pray for us and support us in this earthly journey, we know that Ben is still doing what Ben always did, taking care of his family, looking out for his country, and being the person that he was here on earth took those gifts with him to heaven so that they could be shared with us in a homely way. So we bless the family. We hold you in our prayers. 
And we bless all the friends who are here, remembering them. And we claim the promise that Jesus said, death is simply the gateway to a new life, an eternal life in the presence of God. He has won his reward. And he's preparing the place that we will take when we complete our earthly journey and join him in heaven. So give thanks. Let the tears flow. Let the stories be shared as we celebrate the life and the love of them. Amen. And now, in the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father of all, we pray to you for Vincent, and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let life perpetual shine upon them. May his soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. I now invite those members of the family to come forward and make a statement about life with them. And if you'll come to that microphone so people can hear, that would help. Thank you, everyone, from, for coming today. Um, we appreciate it. Family, friends, um, people that have known my dad in a long time, thank you very much. Um, it's because of the pandemic and because of the, still the current conditions, we can't have a reception following the service. And so we did want to uh, remember dad still in, in some way with the reception. And so on the way out after the service, there are some boxes there uh, with a little memorial to dad in terms of the red, white, and blue and, and something to take home as a, as a take home uh, reception. So please make sure and pick that up on the way out. Today's memorial service for my father is a completion of an 18 month journey since he passed away in April 18th, 2020. Because of the COVID pandemic, we were unable to have a full service at the funeral home and nothing here at the church and nothing at Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery. He particularly wanted that because of the special honor awarded to the veterans of the Battle of the Bulge. My dad, above anything else, was a teacher. Everything he did, he taught my brother and I. He didn't just do something, he showed us how to do it and why we had to do it a certain way to achieve the finished product. This started with gardening. As far back as I can remember, we had a vegetable garden in the backyard. Tomatoes, peppers, radishes, carrots, cucumbers, and pumpkins. Now, Dad had a great respect for science and told us the importance of preparing the soil. He got my brother and I folding GI shovels so that we could help participate in digging and breaking up the soil. I'm not so sure he had complete confidence in Mother Nature. He would get up early in the morning and go out in the garden with a Q-tip and a sheet of paper and tap pollen from the flowers on the tomato and other plants onto the paper and then take the Q-tip, scoop up the pollen and pollinate the plants himself. <laughs> in addition to gardening, he got us a wooden tool chest and we both painted them yellow. Uh, 
we got a saw and a hammer and a screwdriver to start our collection. Over the years, he would fix electrical and plumbing in the house and show us how to do it with him. He replaced the water heaters. He fixed the clothes dryer by replacing the thermocoupler. He showed us how to build things. He helped us with science fair projects. He was very precise and exact in detail. Once he had to open the sewer drain from the front of the house to the street. I remember specifically him digging the trench and the hole to get to the pipe junction. The unusual part was that he made stairs in the dirt to go down to the trench. He didn't just dig a hole and use a ladder, but he actually carved out stairs in the, in the dirt to get to the bottom. The, this, that preciseness was apparent during a science project for school. We were to make a cubic centimeter and bring it to class. Most of the students cut one out of balsa wood with a razor blade and that was it. Dad went to the hardware store and got a small aluminum rod and brought it home. Then I had to use a hacksaw and a file and keep filing and measuring until it was exact. Needless to say, it impressed the teacher and was the example of how big a cubic centimeter was. We built a huge box kite in the basement of our house. I think I was about 10 years old at the time. The object was to make it the biggest kite that we could and still get it to fly. I believe it was about eight foot tall. We made it out of butcher paper and wooden dowel rods and lots of Elmer's glue. We would practice flying it at Kenrick Seminary in the parking lot. Then we took it to the park for a kite flying contest and we got a prize and an article in the Post-Dispatch. We also got an interview at KETC Channel 9 Studios, and which was very exciting for my brother and I. So, my dad was very active in Boy Scouts with us and went on many weekend campouts with us. It was a lot of fun to go camping. This led to our family vacations as being camping vacations. Mom and dad got us a three section tent. The center was the entrance and the two sides were for sleeping. In order to make this work, we practiced in the backyard, setting up the tent and taking it down. My brother and I separated all the poles and put them at the corners. Each of us had a corner. Each of us had a section to raise up for the center part and put up the poles. It was very organized. We also built a camp kitchen in the basement from a plan that Dad had ordered. It was a table, stove holder, pots and pans holder, and it all folded up into one box. Tent camping, tent camping came to an abrupt halt after our vacation to Myrtle Beach. One day, my dad, brother, and I went on a deep sea fishing boat. Mom stayed back at the campsite. It was a rainy and windy day, and apparently the tent was leaking, and it was miserable. Mom's only refuge was to stand in the ladies' restroom building until we got back. That was the end of tent camping. We still went camping, but used a small trailer from that point on. So that brought up a whole new set of duties, leveling the trailer, hooking up the utilities, and dumping the tank when we left the campground. As we were growing up, there were two distinct landmarks that Dad made us aware of. First was Ted Drew's frozen custard. And second was the donut drive-in on Chippewa and Watson. We would get donuts on Saturday night and have them on, for breakfast on Sunday morning. We would stand by the window and look as they were making the donuts. It was a lot of fun, and then we would pick out which ones we wanted. But more important about the donut shop was a plaque inside on the wall, and it said, as you ramble on through life, brother, whatever be your goal, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the whole. He was a perpetual optimist through his entire life, always pushing himself and us to go more and keep a positive outlook on life. He made that more apparent whenever there was a crisis or unexpected setback. He would not look at the negative, but he would look at it as a learning experience. My dad would continue to do more even as he got older by participating in Senior Olympics. 
He, his specialty was race walking, and he loved it. And he won some, many awards for that and participated in, in other events too. When I moved to Las Vegas, my dad took on another very important role. He took my place for my daughter when there, was a father, when there were father-daughter activities. I very, am very appreciative for him for doing that. I have moved back here to St. Louis now, and when I do repair work on my new old house, it was built in 1938, 37, 38. Uh, Mom is always curious as to how do I know how to do these things? How do I know how to fix these things? It's because dad is there with his knowledge and guidance and has never gone away. On all our trips and travels, we would look at the scenery and landscape. Dad would always point to the top of the mountains or the hills and say how nice it would be to have a house up there and look out over the land below. Now he has that home. His resting place at Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery is on top of a hill, overlooking the cemetery on one side and overlooking the Mississippi River on the other. wonderful memories of Grandpa. He can be described as loving, caring, kind-hearted, serving others, competitive, stubborn, dedicated, giving, patient, putting family first, brave, courageous, committed, supportive, and one of my biggest cheerleaders. He and Granny have been involved in every part of my life. From my birth, baptism, first communion, confirmation, honor society inductions, and orchestra concerts. They attended my graduation from high school, Warper College, and the University of Missouri. They attended my dance recitals, Girl Scout events, and helped the science fair projects. We loved going to Cardinal games. A very special Cardinals game was when we celebrated their 65th anniversary and his 90th birthday in the Cardinals Championship Club. Birthday celebrations. The birthday person always got to pick their favorite restaurant of choice. Granny and Grandpa had gifted me by taking me on numerous trips and showing me a slice of America. I will always treasure those trip memories. Grandpa taught me many card games, including poker, um, we played three-person solitaire when they babysat me, sat me, and we loved that. Most recently, we were playing Five Crown and Rummy Cube. When playing games, Grandpa was very competitive. Everyone for themselves, he would say. He showed his patience in try trying to teach me to play golf and fishing my bowl ball out of the water and searching for it in the woods. Pool in the basement, bowling, teaching me to drive in parallel park. We loved riding bikes on Easter and on most of our trips. I enjoyed going down their steep hill in the backyard in the snow, planting, planting and gardening in the backyard, and helping him hang the Christmas lights on the gutters and bushes and putting up the Christmas tree. He always came, even in snow and ice, to our Christmas Eve services, and he belted out the hymns without even being on key. He had a talent for his wonderful grilling skills, especially with pork steaks and hamburgers. He got me started on my love for black olives. And at dinners, he and I, we sometimes had to be the last ones to take the olives in order to make sure that everyone else would have some. I am so fortunate that he and Granny showed me the United States from coast to coast and took me on trips every summer, starting in 87 and through my high school graduation in 99. They took mom and me on trips over spring break to see the Cardinals at spring training, Disney, and Sanibel Island. 
Some highlights from some of our trips include camping in the trailer and Granny and I feeling earthquakes as Grandpa moved around the trailer getting his midnight snack of pretzels and beer. We made campfires and roasted marshmallows, making root beer floats and sitting around the table drinking them while playing Uno. I watched in amazement as he backed up the van and trailer into the camping site, sometimes a very narrow space. We sure did love camping in the trailer. On my first trip to Gulf Shores, Alabama in 87 is where I thought the white sand was snow, where I made volcanoes in the sand and was bitten by jellyfish in the Gulf of Mexico. We hiked trails in Yellowstone, the Grand Tetons, the Badlands, Yosemite, Mount Rushmore, Mesa Verde, the Smoky Mountains, the Four Corners, Washington, D.C., and Shingatig Island. They took me to a rodeo, we rode bikes around Mackinac Island, and swam with the dolphins and stingrays, and they introduced me to escargot on our cruise to the Bahamas. I remember in 1993 when we went to Disney World, and we were still asking the same old question. Does anyone know or had the answer to, where's the condo? We knew it was Grandpa coming in the rental car when the windshield wipers were going, the trunk was open, the emergency flashers were on, and the horn was honking. In 96, they took Natalie and I to Callaway Gardens in Georgia. This is where I water skied for the first time, and I joined the circus with Grandpa and me on the trapeze and walking on the tightrope high above the ground. They always let me explore and did not limit the activities we did on our trips. Grandpa was up for a challenge and always supported me in trying new things. I remember all the Girl Scout dances with Dad dances that Grandpa took me to. There was a sock hop, a do -si do and our last dance was a Cinderella ball in 1995 where we got to ride around in a limo. He dressed up for all the occasions, including even wearing a tuxedo. He always jumped at the opportunity to be there for me and was always up for a new opportunity and experience, no questions asked. I have great memories of the wonderful time spent with all three of my grandparents. They got along great, and it was so meaningful and special for me to be with them. Whether it was a trip to Branson to see the Christmas lights, to Dogwood Canyon to see the waterfalls, and any holiday celebration with meals, and a competitive game of cards. It was always special to have the three of them together, and they were always there for me. Grandpa was so proud of his service in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge. He was a decorated serviceman, having been awarded the Purple Heart, four Bronze Stars, Combat Infantry Man's Badge, five Campaign Stars, in the Belgium and French Legion of Honor. He served in France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Holland, and Germany. He would never brag about his service or his accomplishments. He always showed his support of the military and shared and taught that support to all of us. He proudly participated and attended several reunions of the 83rd Infantry. He helped lead the veterans group at Laclede Grove and made sure to have special events to honor those who served. He was also impressive with his race walking and his volleyball skills and his participation in the Senior Olympics for over 30 years, winning several gold medals for race walking. He came to my elementary school to talk about the St. Louis Olympics in 1904 and to talk about his service in World War II. Grandpa was always there to love and support those around him. He led a life of service, whether it be for his family, his country, or his friends. He always put others first, and if someone was in need, he was always there for him, especially for his family. He will stay alive in all of us and all of our wonderful memories of him and his never-ending love for us. He is now at peace and lying in God's loving arms.
My earpiece always comes out when I take off a mask. What I'm going to read you, I did not write. But a soldier did, our daughter, Leslie. So I've called this A Soldier's Perspective on Ben Freeman. I shared with Jim a few minutes ago that my daughter, who was in service, rose to the rank of major, still has some of those skills. Because on my copy, it says edited version, which is major talk for dad, leave it alone. (laughs) So she is speaking to you. I have known Vin my whole life, at least as long as I can remember. As a kid, I knew Vin and Flo as my parents' friends, whom we visited occasionally. When I joined the Army, Vin and I found a new connection to one another. But it was after my wartime military experience that my buying with Vin were really strengthened. As I've experienced with others, there seems to be a shared understanding of the stresses and tragedies of living through a war. As time went on, we visited more often, and occasionally, Vin asked me to join him in the annual St. Louis chapter of the Battle of the Board, board, excuse me, Battle of the Bulge Reunion. I was stationed in Europe. and had to fly home, bringing my Class A uniform with me. It was a great disappointment. When one of my flights was delayed, causing me to miss the next flight, and miss the reunion entirely. She's now living in Heidelberg, as I say this. Later, my son's Boy Scout troop had an event at the site of the Battle of the Bulge in Belgium. It happened to be the 65th anniversary, 2010. The cold was penetrating. Many Belgians had restored all manner of American World War II equipment and drove them that day in town. There were tanks and jeeps and artillery. These Belgians were on hand to also answer questions. My son, who was 10, was thrilled to be able to climb on the equipment and talk to the Belgians. My younger son and daughter could only think of the warm cafes they could see not too far away. You could imagine how cold it would have to be for the soldiers during the Battle of the Bulge. Later, we watched a parade of World War II veterans march in the freezing weather. The youngest man in the group was 84. On the location of the battle lines outside of town, a museum has been built to honor our American heroes. In the museum, we learned that 67,000 American soldiers gave their lives. Vin was there in the cold fighting for our country. He had joined the Army just a year prior at age 20. Vin first took part in the Africa campaign. That also liberated Italy. 
As Vin's unit advanced north in Europe, sending the Germans running, his unit eventually made it to Belgium. Hitler knew his days were limited, and he decided to attack at the weak point the American lines at the Battle of the Bulge. He wanted to score a breakthrough, separating the Allies. Vin was awarded the Silver Star for his bravery in battle. Most people that win the Silver Star die winning it. Besides, the French awarded him the Croix de Guerre, Cross of War. This is the highest award the French give to a foreigner. Vin helped liberate France as well. This means that Vin saw atrocities and fought under unimaginable conditions in the most difficult parts of the Battle of the Bulge. Vin eventually used the Army GI Bill to attend Washington University. There he met his lovely bride, Flo. Flo was not only organized, caring, and attentive, but also became a wonderful nurse to Vin over the past 10 years in, as he dealt with many health issues. Vin was very proud of his sons, granddaughters, and great-granddaughter. It was heart-wrenching to see he and Flo suffer when their son Don died unexpectedly a few years ago. Vin, Vin would be so pleased to know that Jim has moved back to St. Louis to help his mom. Finally, 10 years ago, I was able to speak at one of Vin's Battle of the Bulge reunions. I was happy to mention to all the soldiers in attendance how much the Belgian people appreciated their sacrifices. I also related how fourth and fifth generations of Belgians are taught about the heroics of the American men. Even after retirement, he was a, he, and he, his retirement as a successful person, he continued to serve. He always sought out other veterans and encouraged them to connect with the VA for health care. In his last years at La Clebe Groves, he helped keep the veterans group there organized and assisted in planning the monthly meetings. Interestingly, like most survivors, Vin never talked about the horrendous things he faced at the Battle of the Bulge. Vin lived his life well and was a true American hero in every aspect, <clears throat> and my life was richer for having known him. Then, thank you for your service.
Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Vincent, and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raised the dead to life. Give to our beloved Vincent eternal life. Vincent was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our beloved Vincent. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, deal graciously with Vincent's family in their grief. Surround them with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. O God, whose days are without end, and whose mercies cannot be numbered, make us, we pray, deeply aware of the shortness and uncertainty of human life, and let your Holy Spirit lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days, that when we shall have served you in our generation, we may be gathered to our ancestors, having the testimony of a good conscience, in the communion of your church, in the confidence of a certain faith, in the comfort of a holy hope, in favor with you, our God, and in perfect charity with the world. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Rest eternal grant unto Vincent, O Lord. May Vincent's soul and the souls of all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do God's will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in God's sight. And the blessing of God the Almighty the grace of Christ the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you, now and always, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.